Hey everybody, it's Caleb here again. And that's right, my DIY Oko can actually move under its own power. I kind of surprised myself because I planned on being at this point a week from now. But the temptation to sprint towards the finish line proved too tempting. In my haste, I did manage to get some video shot of at least the larger steps that I took to get to this point. As you can see right here, I've got one of the drag chains uh, set up on the Y-axis, and it works pretty darn good. I've also got, as you can probably hear, I've also got the belts on there. So that's kind of been a useful little bit of work that I've done. I kind of was originally planning on doing a video after everything was put on, but I kind of just figured, you know, I'm just going to start shooting video and talking about what I you know, have, because I honestly don't know where I'm actually going to get before I have to put the project down for the week. Right here you can see one of the belt clips that I made. Uh, it's made out of cast acrylic, but I'm thinking that this is just a temporary solution right now. I wanted to make it out of something that would mill out really fast, and acrylic does that. Ultimately, I, they're going to be made out of aluminum. I just don't have any eighth inch aluminum to make them out of right now. All right, next up we have the Hall Effect sensor mounts. And on a previous video, I talked about the Hall Effect sensors. They just look like this. Essentially on the X and Y axis, we're going to have these little brackets mounted with a spacer and a bolt. And this is the X axis one, so we can get a little bit closer view of it. You got a hole and a threaded uh, slot right there for the Hull Effect sensor to mount to. So they're pretty simple, uh, but they should work out just fine. I'm going to mount little magnets down for them to trip on. It shouldn't be too hard to mount those and figure out where exactly they need to be. Just something that has to be done. Here's a quick look at the Hall Effect sensor on the Z-axis. As you can see I put a little bit of heat shrink just to make it look a little bit neater. But it's simply just a, a hole that I drilled and tapped for M3 hardware. So uh, essentially there'll be a magnet that's mounted right here that when it hits its extreme, it'll trip it, and it'll be used for the homing and upper limit switch. All right, now to talk a little bit about motor wiring and everything. So these motors are pretty powerful, but they're also kind of on the hungry side for current. As you might notice, they are eight wire motors. The most common motor that you're gonna find is a four wire bipolar. Uh, there are also five, six, and eight wire motors that are technically referred to as unipolar, but you can configure most of those into a bipolar configuration. So what we're gonna do though, is because this is an eight wire motor, we have a couple options. If we wire up this motor in in parallel so that the wiring is all set up for bipolar parallel it's going to need 4.2 amps per coil if we wire this up instead in bipolar series it's only going to need 2.1 amps per coil and we're going to wire it up in series because I'm planning on using the electronics that I have for my X carve which at its core are for Pololu DRV 8825s which I believe their max current output is something like 2.2 so we're probably going to be uh, running them right at their limits but I think it's going to work so essentially we have these two uh, wired up. We have the red and the yellow and the black and the orange. And those are part of the two coils kind of that goes like this. And we can play around with these a little bit. Now, right now nothing is tied together and we can actually uh, kind of move it very freely. But if we just uh, connect the, or kind of tap the green and the blue together, all of a sudden it becomes very hard for me to actually push the Y axis and that's because that we are actually engaging uh, one of the coils. If we engage both of them, it'd get even harder. That's an easy trick to actually figuring out which wires are connected to the same coil if you don't have a actual data sheet. And just to give you a little bit of a follow up, here's all the wires uh, soldered up and heat shrinked with the wire that's actually gonna go down to the controller box. Uh, as you can see, we had to swap a couple colors because we don't have blue or brown, but so we swapped brown for black and blue for red. Uh, but anyways, they're heat shrink all individually and then there'll be a piece of heat shrink that goes over everything and secures the mesh and all that. So should be pretty nice and look good and be secure and shouldn't cause any trouble. All right, so I got one of the connectors wired up with the uh, Hall Effect sensor and I just wanted to test it. So I've got a little like 5 volt power supply or wall warp power supply and I'm just going to plug it in. I've got my multimeter hooked up so that the 
common is hooked up to the ground of the power supply and the other lead is connected to the signal so essentially when we trip it with this little magnet that I've got on the end of this wrench we should be able to see what kind of signal or voltage and everything we're getting through as you can see now that it's turned on it's got about 200 and some millivolts of current going through the signal but I'm guessing that's not that uh, significant hopefully it's not but if we put the magnet so that it trips the Hall effect sensor one you can see that one of the lights goes off and the other thing is that it you can see that the signal wire goes up from that few hundred millivolts to uh, six volts so that's pretty interesting which I know for a fact that I noticed that the uh, wall wart that I have is rated technically for five volt but it nominally is at about six volts just a quick reference here on how I've set up the SuperPID speed sensor. I've simply just kind of drilled a hole in to the casing from kind of right next to the power cable here and it kind of goes through another little wall and then it reads off of the, there's a little wheel right above the copper pads where the brushes contact. And it works pretty simple. Just got a piece of white that I painted on with some paint and that's pretty much it. I still got to paint another coat on there, I think. But right now, it's giving me actually pretty good readings on the spindle view. All right, just to kind of finish up on the spindle part, uh, we've, we've obviously modified this for the SuperPID. We've got the SuperPID uh, RPM sensor in right here, as we talked about earlier. And then we've got our power going straight. The neutral is going out to this wire, which has got a, a quick disconnect underneath this heat shrink. And then the live wire is going to the switch and then going out to the other side of the coil uh, so that's pretty much it very simple very basic all right so after a ton of wiring i've pretty much got the drag chains all put away with all the wires there's one thing i'd like to mention and that's if you haven't seen drag chains that much there's two types uh, that you'll see being sold around amazon and ebay and all that stuff one of them they're all solid links and you have to route your cables through and fish them and it's really kind of a pain. The other type have these little clip on clip off links and each link opens up and then they just snap shut like that kind of and I highly recommend seeking these types out. While we're on the topic of drag chains so this is basically how I mounted the y-axis one. You can see right here on I've kind of got a little tab that I have mounted up on the motor and basically just have it attached like that. Which, fun fact, that piece of aluminum tab there is actually one of the motor mount straps or part of a motor mount strap from my original Shape Oco 2. So this build actually has a bit of my Shape Oco 2 in it. So I think that's kind of a cool little thing. It's really hard to see it because of the lighting, but there's actually one screw that's right here and that's drilled and tapped with an M5 screw right at the end of the Y-axis rail. Same sort of thing is happening up here on the X-axis too. On the other side of the x-axis, I've just drilled and put a screw and a nut on, on the top of the z-axis plate. That seemed to be a really good place. The only thing that's a little bit of a problem there is that I'm missing a little tiny bit of travel, I think. Uh, or that could be just because of the belt clip over here is hitting the idler wheel. One of the only little problems with those belt clips. Gotta figure that out, but I'm only losing at max a quarter inch, so maybe I won't even need it, I don't know. Alright, we're almost ready to actually get this thing running under its own power, I think, but before that I wanted to talk about a few things that I didn't really have time to shoot any video on. The most obvious thing is this mount that I put on the back of the table frame that has the monitor and super pid mounted to it. It's a very simple wood frame that's just made up of two wood boards that are painted black. And the idea here is that I wanted the monitor and the super pid in an orientation that allowed me to see everything at about any angle while working on the machine. You can also probably tell that there's not a lot of room for the keyboard and mouse over on the side. I'm planning on making a little drawer or something or a lower shelf for that to sit on. Other than that, I think it's pretty much ready to go and as promised, let's actually see this thing run. This is of course quite a momentous occasion for me. I've been working on this project for somewhere around nine months it seems like and there has been times where I never thought it was going to be completed. It just seems like it's kept moving on slowly and surely and it's really really exciting to finally see it uh, come to fruition 
Really happy that the super pit is running properly. Can't believe I nailed it the first time and it seems to be running without any hiccups. So I'm really happy with that. I just want to make sure that the super pit and the spindle don't adversely affect the operation of the stepper motors and everything. Uh, so far it doesn't look like it is. But yeah, it's, it's running. It's amazing. It's exciting. There's still a lot more work to be done, but it's, this is just amazing. I'm so excited. Well, that about wraps up this video for this week. I actually never planned on being to this point already. I figured that it would take at least another week or so, but here we are. I was able to manage to actually sprint towards the finish line and get it to the point where it's actually running under its own power and moving around, and that's, uh, that's quite a feeling. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff, and I'll see you next time.